Hello, Babette. Do you hear us? Yes, I hear you very well. <laughs> Thank you so much for your beautiful film that we just saw. Um, I would like to start with a question regarding Calamity Jane. Um, I was wondering whether uh, Calamity Jane in the common imagination of people in the United States is a legend that is well known. And perhaps also was she well known among the feminists of the time like she was with Delphine Seyrig? At the time where Delphine was very active as a feminist, let's say in the late 60s, the, the book was published in the late 60s, in 68, I think, or 67, the first edition okay, of the letter of uh, Calamity Jane to her daughter. And those letters really, when I read them, uh, you know, in the late 70s, I was preparing a film. I, I shot a film, uh, I, shot, I shot a film on landscape and I bought the book in a, in a Western, uh, you know, a trading post, a place where uh, this kind of literature, which are, uh, you know, made from the 19th century uh, discovering of the West, you could find story of that kind. And it was part of my film. So I bought it and I read it and I was done. I bought it for many of my friends which were feminists or who were interested in relationship between mother and daughter. And it became really read by women, you know, in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. Now, uh, Delphine bought the book in 79 in English, obviously, therefore in the original edition. And in the edition which was made by the C Press, you know. Uh, so the edition she's discussing during the film with uh, Sheila, uh, Sheila Foote, you know, uh, who owned the original manuscript, then you have seen uh, film in the, in the film, you have just seen. Yeah. But definitely the film... The, the book, uh, for me, is the book, which really I knew Kamiti Jane, but I knew very little about her. And it's when I focused on the landscape of the Western, I, 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 you know, it's interesting to understand that women masqueraded that man to be able to have a man uh, freedom that man had that women did not have. So... You know, in the 19th century, women uh, became soldiers because they were they were masculine. In, 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 you know, they were interested in actually having an experience they could not have if they were staying dressed as women. And I think that was also very compelling for us. You know, I mean, for me, I did not ask permission to become a camera person. That was a job for men. So I was not supposed to want to do that job, but fuck them, you know, you, I, I did not dress as a man, but I wear uh, pants from the time I was 20 years old. That was not the rule, you know, for women who wear pants, really, even in that, but, uh, in the 60s, you know, so, and, and when well, that's it, it's not, it's not so much the attitude of Termity Jane and what she did in the 19th century is that book. It's really that book which made a feminist icon. And when Delphine first read the book and up to the point when she decided that she was going to make this film, how long this was she I thinking mean, she about this? In 79, and I think she immediately wrote that text. And it's the early 80s. I had not read the book. I was in Europe. Uh, I was uh, in the U.S. I lived in the U.S. since 19 October 70, basically. You know, so it's more American than French, frankly. But um, the 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 impact of the book was very strong, I think, in that period because it was a period where feminism was already having to renew itself. You know in the late 70s. I mean, the, the heyday of feminism in the US is really in the 60s and 70s. And at the end of the 70s, you know, 
the situation is going to change. We're, here in the U.S., we're going to have Reagan. You know, when I read that book, Reagan was president. So we knew then abortion was uh, in danger. We knew then God knows what else, you know, and all the grand forties disappeared. So we started to have huge problem to produce work, too, as uh, people, uh, you know, in my in my circle, basically. So I think... I'm not sure the impact of the book is coming just from that, but definitely it's connected to the fact that for Delphine, it's the second phase of her activity as a feminist too, you know. Uh, so that's, I think, important. Now, what happened, I did not want to focus on the fact that Delphine wanted to make a film which could never be made because she was refused funding. But she was given, she, she managed to raise funding to do the, the documentary material that I shot, and which is the basis of the film Camille Jane and Delphine Seringa's story, because it, it's the investigation that Delphine wanted to make for the legitimacy of that book, basically. And... Uh, and I thought that that was, you know, the, the research was more important than to uh, uh, explain why she did not get money. For me, it was clear, you know, why uh, uh, it was clear not then I had applied to uh, the CNC, but because I was very close to Chantal, I knew then, uh, you know, why that need not work, basically. Could you talk a bit more about the research that you did together and the travels around searching for traces well, I mean, of calamity, Jane? Clearly, clearly, Delphine, we discussed the fact that she was there as the director of the film, but she has to be, she, she was also an actress, so she performed being the director. And we discussed how I will show her. And I did not want to have to have two cameras and the cameras with her asking questions. So do back and forth between the questions she will ask. It was an interview film, basically. So, uh, you know, I wanted to focus on the people she interviewed and therefore I had to use her back. But at the same time, the tone of her voice and the, the, the framing of the space as a way to, uh, to establish her as the person uh, guiding the investigation about Calamity Jane, then she's making in a pursuit of, uh, you know, trying to make a film about Calamity Jane. And also the cultural difference, you know, I mean, on one hand, you have somebody who is one of the best educated and sophisticated person you can imagine, which is Delphine Serig, also a great actress, a great theater actress, and, and somebody who is interested in playing a part, which is the opposite of what she was identified to, you know, the sophistication by excellence of uh, last year in Marion Bad, and in many ways, uh, she wanted to fight that that image that uh, uh, Alain René had given her and had tried to undo with Muriel, but Muriel never really undid that in a way. And she needed, uh, Camille Jane was for Delphine, I think, uh, the idea of really creating a character then, which was original for her, something really she had to invent from scratch, you know. So I uh, that's also what, but the reason I started the, the, the diagram of the image, uh, then uh, her son, Duncan Youngerman, did for the storyboard that Delphine did uh, in the 1980, 1981 to develop the film, you know, where you have a, a calamite being seen with her legs spread open because that's, that's a gesture you see only in men, you know, women keep their legs together and men open them up, you know. So that was for me the key for what Delphine wanted to play the part, you know. I, I, I could not put my judgment into the movie because that was about Delphine and Calamity and not about me, but uh, it was really important to... Uh, to, to give some inclination of why she was interested in, in interpreting such a part, you know, of a man primarily dressed only as, as uh, a woman 
dress primarily as a man. Uh, and um, and that's how I finish with the later text she wrote, uh, which is about, you know, Calamite uh, is the end of the film, you know, when she thinks Calamite did not think of any role, she did not think masculine versus feminine as a main role, she is not atrophied by paternalism, like we, uh, unfortunately, uh, people of, of my generation and even my generation, and hopefully not yours, you know, <laughs> are still <laughs> recovering from patriarchy, <laughs> pressing, <laughs> pressing on, on us the, you know, the uh, enormous weight to prevent us to be free, basically. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. I was wondering also, because obviously you had a lot of material from like when you were doing the research as well as the script. Yeah, I, how I did you decide the what enormous to amount. And, yeah. How did I mean, you I read it? basically uh, whatever Duncan let me. I did not read much of the conversation and the letter is not a uh, road, but he suggested that letter, which is so great because you speak of a, a, an, um, Chantal helping Delphine uh, try to get money from the German, which is the place where she got money for us to shoot uh, news from home, you know. And I got money from them to do my film uh, 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 on landscape, actually, the one was doing 1980 when I bought the, the you know. And... Uh, uh, so, uh, Eckert Stein was the man who was deciding those art projects by uh, independent filmmaker from different country, you know, for ZDF, yeah, which is a very important, uh, she's a bit like Carte, you know, and obviously uh, uh, what produced many films of the Fassbinders. So, uh, you know, most of... Uh, personal film, or you could say art film, or and film made by women or by a man, but uh, on subjects which were not necessarily popular, uh, were produced by television in the 60s, the 70s, and, uh, and the 80s, until the mid-90s, and that kind of stuff then, you know. Uh, but uh, it was really an important source of, uh, of funding for a um, film which could be made cheaply. So that letter was wonderful because uh, it really showed uh, uh, the insecurity of Delphine, you know? And I thought that was so touching. Somebody so famous, uh, you know, which at the same time is risking to fail and uh, but want to want to keep on, on, on inventing a new uh, self, a new, basically, which I, I thought is really important, you know. It's not important to fail, it's important not to try. Do you, could you talk a bit about how you met Delphine? Did you met Delphine through Chantal Ackerman? Or did you know yeah, her I before met Delphine that? the first day I came to, uh, to work on uh, Jean Dillman. I obviously, I had seen uh, uh, La Chérie Norienbad and I had seen Muriel and I had seen the film, a film I adore, which is their first film. Then she did in, uh, in the US, which is a film by Robert Friend and Alfred Leslie, which is called Prove My Daisy, which I think is also extraordinary. So I knew that film very well. So uh, probably better than any other film and I had a great admiration for her there in that film, actually. Uh, so, because the film was really improvised, you know, and made a little bit like a silent movie, and uh, Kerouac wrote the, in uh, Pull My Daisy, that film that I'm discussing from 60, uh, uh, 58, you know. So she was still uh, taking care of her son in, um, in uh, in New York with her husband and uh, was a painter and a friend of uh, Fred Leslie. So that's the reason, and she was so lovely. So that's the reason she was cast. She was a friend also of uh, Bob Frank, you know, Robert Frank, a great photographer, obviously. And uh, so 
I kind of had an enormous admiration for her. Sorry, somebody is trying to call me. Uh, so I had an enormous admiration for her, but I met her when uh, I arrived uh, two weeks before the shooting of the films to make the test and so on, and to take decision about color. And, and the film was there, obviously, doing costume, makeup, my God. And, uh, uh, So I, I knew about her and uh, I think she was a little bit tentative because she had no idea what I had done before. Although I had worked with somebody she knew very well, uh, Michael Lonsdale as an AC, as an assistant camera. I have shot four features with him. Uh, one of them actually I was a DP, but uh, it was not a very important role. But uh, uh, Michael Lonsdale who died recently and uh, was really an extraordinary actor and a close friend of Delphine, and they had just worked in, uh, in Diasang. And uh, so we discussed in Diasang, and I knew all the film of Marguerite Duras before, so, you know, I was a cinephile, and we could, when we talked, we, we could, uh, I, I, I could enter into a world, you know. But I think, Obviously, the, the, the lighting of uh, um, Jeanne Dillman was, was uh, very important, and she was in every shot. I think there is no shot where she's not in. So it was a huge task for her. Uh, and, and for me, I, I needed to make sure, uh, you know, I was showing her uh, the way she was supposed to be seen naturalistically, you know, not in a, in a studio set and it was shot on location anyway. So I could, I could develop a style, which is the, uh, changing in relation with the time of day, which the, the condition of the light outside, which is exactly what I wanted to do. So it was corresponding to my aesthetic and, uh, and also to the necessity for the film. Yeah. And I knew Chantal very well, and we were close friends, so uh, he, he, he went very well for my part. And, uh, you know, everybody thinks then the film is such a great film because of Delphine, because she's a great actress, because of Chantal, because she's, and because of me, basically. <laughs> yeah. Of course. I will now uh, give an opportunity for the audience to pose a question if they have some. Just raise your hand and... No? Then I'll ask another question. Um, because uh, on uh, in this cycle that we have about uh, Delphine Seyrig and about uh, the film activism in France and, and so on, we were also discussing a lot about the role of actresses in that period of time. And I was wondering to hear a bit more about being a female cinematographer in that time. Um, how was it for you in that time? And do you think that things are slowly changing for female cinematographers? Oh, definitely in France, they have been changing since the 90s, yeah. There has been a big shift in the 80s. In the U.S., it came later, and most <coughs> women uh, who are cinematographers managed to get there because they, uh, they obviously are lucky at some point, but uh, they also uh, make them some specialist of, the, of, of something, you know. But in Europe, I don't know really. There is very well-known cinematographer in Germany. Uh, I don't think in Italy, but definitely in France. Yeah, many. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Godard, Agnès Godard, uh, who is the cinematographer of Claire Denis, is, I think, remarkable, you know, and has been a well-known cinematographer for, uh, for 30 years, literally. Uh, Norita Vive, which did many documentaries for Agnès Varda, Never did fiction, really. So she was she was already, uh, you know, uh, um, pushed in a corner in a way because of it. But she definitely, while it, while it, 
was established in the 80s. She's one of the first. We are the same generation. I ask her, how come Lidec, you know, I, yeah, I had to pass an exam uh, to enter. There was two schools when I discovered there was school to learn how to be a cinematographer. When I decided then I was interested to do that because I wanted to work on film, you know, and I was not interested to become a director or to be an editor or to write script or whatever. I was interested in the image. And I passed the two exam and the two exam I did very well because, you know, I had an education, I was in mathematics, I, I knew, and I knew how to write, you know, so I did good papers or whatever. And, um, and the deck refused me because they, uh, I was second, received second in both school, you know. Uh, there was a man which was in front of me, which was, uh, which was first, but in the deck, they they told me they will not let me enter in the cinematography section. I could only do any of the other sections. So I inserted them and I went to the other school, which in a way was much better for me because I learned technical material, which uh, were very useful later on. You know, in a way now what I learned in school is irrelevant. You know, uh, it was it was relevant maybe for a couple of years and. Uh, you learn from looking at other people's film and for doing film yourself, you know. Uh, but the basis of really understanding optics and understanding, uh, you know, the chemistry of the lab and the processing. So the technical aspect of cinematography was really important. And among my class, we had the best cinematographer. I mean, one of them got the uh, Oscar in Hollywood and, uh, you know, Philippe Rousseau is a great cinematographer. And, uh, so my promotion at uh, Vaugira was much more successful than the promotion the same year at Lidec. And, but Nourit was accepted in the cinematography section the, day, the year after. And I asked her in the 80s or in the, the mid 80s when we met, you know, uh, in Germany, because there was a, 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 a symposium made of women in different countries, which were cinematographer and uh, to share story, you know. That's how I know the, that the situation had really changed, you know, uh, in the 80s. Uh, Nuri told me, you know, they did not care because I was not French, I was uh, Israeli, so they did not care if I was failing. They did not want you to fail. You know, a school basically is taking decision to make sure that the student they accept can succeed. And they were sure I will not succeed. Now for me, I, you know, I, I wanted to be a cinematographer until about the, the late seventies. And then I say, making film is so much more interesting. I'm going to just do that, you know, cinematography. I did it for making a living, but my, the last film, I really put a lot of myself in 78, you know, and the film of uh, Delphine, because there I was pod director, you know, Bec and, and actually that's, we, we discuss how, how it should be framed with Delphine to make sure uh, uh, um, I, I, I was framing her in such a way that she had a great importance, but at the same time, she was a listening, you know, she was listening. She was, she was, uh, she wanted to understand the story, which is a very compelling uh, acting to do, you know, especially if you only have you back. But Delphine was a great actress, you know. <laughs> So I'm really happy about that. Any question at this point? No? But you you moved from France to New York after your studies, right? Was that because of more work opportunities for a cinematographer or not? No, no, not at all. I moved because I wanted to see experimental work which I knew about because I was friends with somebody named Noel Birch, who made several films, but is essentially a film critic and was American and had arrived in Paris uh, because he wanted to avoid the draft for the Korean War. So he'd arrived in Paris and learned French and wrote a great book, which was published in 66, I think, or 67. Uh, in French translation, but had been published, uh, written in English. 
and uh, uh, um, where he discussed experimental work and in particular work of the person who trained me, a great filmmaker named Marcel Anon, who died a couple of years ago, but was really somebody very important in my life. And because he, he really gave me the possibility to become an AC, an assistant camera in 68 and in 69, where I did uh, you know, those films where Michael Lonsdale, who is really a great uh, French-English actor, uh, worked. And uh, in particular, uh, uh, the film shot in 69 called Le Printemps got me to meet somebody who lived in New York and told me then basically I should come to New York if I was interested in experimental work. And I thought I was coming to New York for three months to look at film, you know as not really to work with those people. I, I end up to do that actually because I stay longer. But uh, you see what I mean? It's uh, it, it just as, um, as always, I have always been a, a film buff, you know, somebody who want to, to, to see film, which could interest me as, as, as public, you know, as an audience. Uh, and which trigger your imagination and are interesting formally. And uh, the reason I think I could be such a good cinematographer is because I had learned so much from, uh, uh, you know, the camera work in the, in the Mizoguchi film or in the Ozu film, which are Japanese film, or in Minelli and, uh, 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 you know, Kuko, which are uh, uh, like Mizoguchi. Uh, three filmmakers, the two American one filmmaker, which did absolutely fantastic uh, camera movement, you know, dolly movement. So I learned a lot about, before going to film school, about what the camera could do to express things, in, to express the space and the body of the actor differently. That's the reason I felt, and that's what I was seeing in those films, and that's the reason I wanted to be a camera person. I had no idea it would be difficult, and I will never find a job, and I end up to uh, leaving film school, being able only to find a job in editing and learning editing, which is very useful if you're a camera person, but I had no idea when I did that. I did that saying, oh my God, I should not do that. I should wait until I have a job, but I had to pay my rent, and I had to buy food, you know, and and so on and so on. So I did other job, all connected to film, but uh, in an, the other area where I wanted to. Uh, but Marcel, which knew that, I worked with him because he was the, in a jury, which had seen the film I had done in film school and had given a surprise. So he was living in my neighborhood and he was a filmmaker. And I learned then he was the president of the jury. I had not gone to the festival. But the people I'd work with, uh, the, the festival was, uh, I'd work with Greek uh, a student uh, from my school, and uh, they told me about his name. And when I checked his address, uh, I noticed he was two doors from my, uh, from my studio, you know, from my room, basically my... Uh, uh, it's a room which had just uh, cold water and the toilet on the landing, you know, very small and so on. And, uh, but there was a student room, you know, uh, originally made for maid uh, on the top floor, you know, of a, of a bourgeois household in the fifth arrondissement. So uh, I worked uh, with as an assistant editor for Marcel, not being as an intern, not being paid, but he knew I wanted to become a camera person. So when he could, uh, when he found money to do a film, which was a fiction film, he recruited me and I did a great job. So he kept recruiting me and trained me and, and taught me everything, you know. So I owe him a lot, yeah. And... Um, one of the reasons I went to New York is because at the film festival in Brussels, in uh, Belgium, Noc Le Zut, in 67, there was a film I had uh, helped him do, which was there, a documentary on Gaudi uh, shot in Barcelona. Gaudi is a famous article, I'm sure you know that. And um, was designed garden and, uh, you know, uh, 
the Basilica in Barcelona and so on. And um, so that film did not got any prize. And he told me the film which got the prize is by Michael Snow and his wavelength. And, you know, he described it in a way which was so dismissing. It was kind of intriguing. He said it's 45 minutes and nothing happened. And, uh, you know, somebody else who was coming from New York had seen the film and was friends with Michael Snow and admired the film and wrote about it, told me, but it's not at all that and described the film very differently. So I say, I have to make up my mind and see that film, you know, because Marcel is not a dummy. So he dismissed the film, but he's not particularly pro experimental work where I am, you know. So I may as well go to New York to because the film could not be seen in France. So that's the reason I went to, yeah. And I stay longer because theater, theater was absolutely fantastic at that time. So I did photograph of theater and that's how I could make enough money to stay and live poorly. But, you know, it was relatively possible to get a, a job with minimal wage and still, you know, live about the way I've lived in France, you know, with very little money, but uh, pretty happy about the way I was spending my client, my time and not needing more money than what I had, basically, to have a fulfilling life, yeah. One last chance for a question from the audience? No? Then a last question for me. Um, are you preparing a new film, perhaps? Do you have something in but your mind? I was mind? supposed to, but, you know, I'm very, um, I'm not young, obviously, and I have all kind of uh, a tuberculosis when I was a child, so I have damaged lung, I have uh, uh, a blood pressure, which is, you know, contained with medication, but uh, so the COVID, uh, the possibility to be infected is really great. And uh, uh, the U.S. is a basket case, uh, basket case, as you probably know in the press. You know, I hope in Slovenia you are not like that, but uh, you have a coherent uh, health uh, uh, response to the pandemic. But in, you know, now in a way the president is now affected, but he's still denying the fact then the 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 end of the 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 infection is around the corner which is absolutely not true you know uh, uh, in the three days he was at the hospital another 3500 uh, american died you know 3500 you know 7000 in in one week more uh, uh, less than one week five days i think so uh, you know it's getting worse and worse you could say now, where I am, I'm protected because I'm in total quarantine. Uh, I'm still thinking I will take the risk to take a plane to go to France to uh, hug my brother and my nephews, and my family and my friend. Uh, because it's still worthwhile to have a life, you know. But uh, doing a shoot, I don't. Uh, now I'm, I'm writing and I'm, you know, teaching and... Uh, so uh, I want to write in my old age. So I'm, I'm, I'm reading a lot, you know, so I'm, I'm active, but uh, I'm not traveling really. I was supposed to shoot in May, but I could not because that was much worse. And, uh, and, and I'm not sure I'm going to, to do what I wanted to do at that time, but I'm, I'm still working on a little film I shot during the, the quarantine in the spring, yeah. I, I have accumulated footage than I did, and I have not edited that yet, but I will. But it's going to be a minor film, you know, a short film. So, there Thank it is. you so much. No big project for the time being. Mm. Thank you so much for the film that we were able to see today, and thank you so much for your time and answering my questions. I'm sorry, there is no question from the audience. Yeah. Could you ask? <laughs> I am too. <laughs> Perhaps one last chance. Hey, oh, there's one. There's there one, one woman <laughs> who is going to be brave and one man who is going to be brave. Okay. Thank you uh, for having you here. Uh, I have one question for the landscape uh, that you were uh, 
touching on the topic. Uh, did you come any closer or could you explain a bit about the landscape topic that you were also interested in when you read about Calamity Jane? So uh, can you repeat the question? The question is about the landscape I used in the movie that you have just seen. Yeah, because you said you you got interested into the story because you were also interested in the landscape of the western, of the western. Yes, I was I was not so much interested in the landscape of the western. I was interested in landscape, which is for the first time seen by people who have never seen that landscape before. Therefore, which is before man. At least on in the in the very Eurocentric vision of the world, I still had in the eighties, you know. Uh, 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 but uh, Europe as a concept of landscape, which is so different from America. In America, you know, one hundred fifty years ago, uh, people had never seen the Grand Can had never seen the Grand Canyon, you know. And the, 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 the severity of a tornado and, uh, and, uh, and droughts and, uh, and the unuse of that land in the west of the Rocky, you know, and in a kind of depression between two mountain range is kind of interesting because it's a kind of mini desert. And I was very interested in the condition of the desert. I visited the Sahara when I was, uh, you know, 20, uh, 21, 22, uh, visiting uh, my uncle in Algeria. So I, I thought any deserted uh, area was fascinating to think about. And in the 80s, you know, moving out of New York seems to be the thing to do. Yeah. So, uh, but in the case of uh, the shooting of the film, in Billings, Montana, it's obvious that I had to evoke the fact that the woman who wrote those letters was mostly sleeping out outside, you know, with very little protection, and uh, or maybe in uh, in a makeshift log cabin which had absolutely no uh, no uh, fire or whatever. You know, being being exposed to the outside was really important. So I, I felt uh, I had to do that. We shot in the summer, so obviously there is a lot of sun. But uh, I wanted to evoke the, the harshness of living outside, yeah. Which I am known because when I shot my landscape movie, I had very little money, so I uh, I camped. And that was a great way to to experience the film. You know, uh, uh, the first time you were there, most of the people they were uh, uh, they had horses and cattle, and they were moving to go and find land where they could create a farm for to to settle. You know, so they were they were mostly w w traveling on foot. You know, and that experience I wanted to communicate. So in many ways. At the time of uh, of uh, of Calamity's life, she was born in the early sixties, eighteen sixties. The train were already built. You know, they were not all over the place, but train were part of it, and it's such an important integration of uh, you know of civilization in America. Uh, and, and a way to also push out the Native American, uh, the Indian tribe out of their, uh, of their territory, basically. So the, that had to be, the train had to be shown, you know. So the, the building was like all those cities, you know, made around an important uh, train depot and bus depot. And I, I needed to to show that, you know, even if people don't understand, we don't know anything about America, you know, for me, that was, that was the way you bring, uh, you bring the sense of, uh, and now, obviously, when the film is finished, that makes no sense, people use only plane, train, you know, or just for much merchandise, and are not for passenger anymore, and actually, that's what you saw even in, uh, in 83, in the footage I shot then, you know. 
So that was a good question, yeah. But also it was important to have those landscapes because I wanted to have images to, sh to read from the book uh, linked to, uh, you know, the beginning of the story, which was the beginning of the way uh, Delphine wanted to make a film out of the, of the material and to, to trace to the solitude and the loneliness of uh, Jane in her later years. And, uh, you know, I needed those landscapes to, uh, to do that, yeah. So I needed footage to have the voice of Julia who play who read the, the text of the of the journal. You know, as a filmmaker, you you constantly think, which sound do I need? Which image do I need? So you 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 knew I, I kind of knew, like for instance, at stage Delphine in the cafe reading the book, which is the version then she la foot uh, uh, published, you know, with the red cover. So I told her I, you could use that, you know, when you edit the film. Uh, so the the, uh, the the her waiting at the hotel, all of that was staged by me in a way, you know. I mean, she all agree obviously because she understood. Then she could use that as material for voiceover or whatever. So many things were planned in '83, not knowing. That's what you do when you're a filmmaker, you know. You plan for different different uh, different uh, scenario you could say yeah when did you come back to the material uh, for the first time in 2011 you know I wrote that in the text I thought I had sent it to you I mean I sent it to Natasha and Giovanna uh, I wrote that after the finishing of the film in the end of September uh, 2019 yeah is the making of the film of Camille Jane and Delphine Serig, Delphine Serig uh, story. Uh, so the footage, I never saw it, you know, I shot it and uh, I actually was sick after, at the end of it, uh, not during the shoot, but coming back to New York. And Delphine uh, went to the hospital in an emergency. I had a very serious bladder infection and Delphine went back with the footage in France and uh, and literally uh, three months later, I was in the hospital and uh, being diagnosed with uh, tuberculosis in my kidney and needing a kidney, uh, I mean, to have a kidney being removed, basically. So I did not go to France for two and a half years, you know, three years at least. And, and I had a huge amount of debt, so I did not make film for 10 years, you know. Uh, so that was a real setback. So I never, I never saw the footage. I mean, logically, I should have gone. I was not going for Christmas at that time. I did not have enough money, but I will have gone in the summer, you know, uh, uh, in the summer of uh, 1984. But then I was recovering from surgery and I was so poor, I had no job. And, uh, you know, I had $150,000 of debts and, uh, and uh, physically I had to uh, remake a body which could sustain being a camera person to make a living, you know, or to be a teacher or whatever. So uh, I never saw the footage and I discovered it, but I, 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 I always wanted to see it. So when uh, the sound, uh, audiovisual uh, Simone de Beauvoir approached me uh, with Duncan, uh, which I had met uh, with his mother as a child, but he did not probably remember me, but uh, I knew of his existence, if you want. They came and told me, you want to edit the material? I say, yes, yeah. So I started to do something, but it was not interesting. And I say, I have to find a way to to do something with it. And it's when uh, uh, Giovanna came, Giovanna is working with Natasha and I know you heard Natasha discuss the story on Infomus, which she did in collaboration with Giovanna. And Giovanna uh, came in San Diego where I teach, at the university where I teach in, uh, uh, in 2016, in January, 2016, invited by a friend of mine who is an art historian. 
and made me discover uh, an important feminist uh, in Italy, uh, uh, which I knew nothing about, and uh, and and told me she was planning that project about Delphine Serig and uh, Camille Jane, and I said, "My God, that's fantastic!" and uh, and that's when the the necessity of doing something came back, and uh, and therefore the 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 framing of making the film more about feminism uh, became attractive, you know. And therefore, I had to find feminism for me started in the U.S., not in France, you know. Definitely, the sign of it. In I mean, it started globally too. There is trace of uh, you know movement of women all over the, the, the world in the, in the 60s, but uh, uh, it started, so I started with somebody who made the first women's program and he's the one who, uh, you know, you see in the first 10 minutes of the film, J.J. Wilson, a friend of uh, Adele Adnam, who worked with Delphine at the end on the script, which was never finished and partially lost and so on. So... Uh, that's how I got the contact of J.J. Wilson, but she's listed in the inside the booklet, which I I had I had all the different edition of the uh, of the books, you know. So the French translation, which was done pretty quickly, I think it's first published in the eighties. And you know, it's amazing. I went to Pompidou, I think, in twenty eighteen to renew or 2019 to renew my membership card because I go there and, you know, uh, they do great shows. So even if I'm in France for only one month here and two weeks there, I, I, I can see shows for without waiting, you know, so why not be a member? Besides, I also am an artist, so I can, uh, and they have film of mine in their collection. So they, uh, and even photography now. So they, they, they gave me a discount, uh, but uh, the person who sold me the card, uh, 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 I don't know what she told me then. Uh, uh, she was pregnant and no, she had just given birth and she had read that book, Committee Jane Letter to a Daughter, and she was very impressed. And I said, my God, you know that book? She had read it in French. She was coming from Turkey. She was a new immigrant working at Pompidou, you know. It's astonishing in 20, uh, 2019, you know, 2018. So I, I thought it was a good sign. I was, I was, uh, I had worked uh, with JJ uh, then. I had shot the footage of JJ in 2018, but I had not yet tackled all the research at Duncan. I did that in the summer 18. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. The project was long to be made, but I think because of that, it's pretty, uh, it's interesting to retrace how it was made. Yeah. Thank you so much for all the stories and uh, the. No, no, no. Thank you for the question, too. I hope I answered properly. <laughs> I, I think mean, I answered <laughs> the, real, the real question. I did not answer just about. Well, you told us a lot of interesting things about so many. Okay. So I'm really okay. grateful for your time and for all the answers you gave us. Okay. Thank you so much once again for the film. Okay. Thank you again. Yeah. And thanks to everybody who has stayed for so long. Bye-bye. <laughs>